uh, the Canadian Union of Public Employees for uh, helping to sponsor tonight's event and co-presenting it, and the 251 Community Center for having us here. And I think it's also just really important that we acknowledge that we're on land uh, that is traditional and ceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. And it's especially important when we're talking about national security issues and things we're talking about tonight because one of the groups that's seen uh, an impact have been indigenous land defenders across the country when it comes to attacks on dissent and protest under the guise of national security. Um, so tonight's talk is about uh, Bill C-51. Um, the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group is a coalition uh, that started in 2001, uh, sorry, 2002, um, shortly after the adoption of the first Anti-Terrorism Act. And Bill C-51 was the second Anti-Terrorism Act in 2015. And the reason that we came together was because we, people saw and acknowledged that there was going to be an impact on civil liberties and human rights, both in Canada and internationally, because of these laws and because of Canada's participation in the war on terror. And um, Bill C-51, uh, so many years later, of uh, 14 years later, was seen as something that drastically ramped up, even though there have been other, obviously, national security laws that come, some had gone, but mostly come, <laughs> throughout that time. Uh, C-51 uh, drastically increased the powers that have been granted under Bill C-36, the first Anti-Terror Act. Um, and it sparked uh, protests across the country. Um, it sparked uh, protests from civil liberties and human rights experts. And it was an unpopular bill at only 33% of support by the time the elections rolled around. We all know that the bill was adopted, but there was a promise by the, um, by the Liberal government at the time during the elections that they would act to repeal the most egregious parts of Bill C-51. It's been two years of having Bill C-51. Uh, we're going to talk tonight about what some of those impacts that are that we've seen over those two years, but also whether or not the Liberals have lived up to that promise and what, and what we need to do or keep doing in order to make sure that human rights and civil liberties are at the heart of, um, of uh, national security and essentially keeping Canadians safe and how, how we define that. Is it by locking down our borders or is it making sure that people have health, uh, healthy, safe standards of living and are able to you know, prosper and exercise their rights? Um, so I also wanted to mention that tonight is a fundraiser for the ICLMG. We didn't have our cash box set up when everyone came in, but we're a member-funded organization. We have 45 members across the country, ranging from human rights to labor to environmental to faith-based organizations, um, feminist organizations, uh, and they support us, but we also, uh, we're a small organization with a small budget, and we're always, especially right now, when there's so much to be campaigning and working on, um, always uh, grateful for any support that people can, can give us. Um, if you're not able to give tonight, we've started a new uh, page on Patreon, which is a website where people can donate monthly uh, to causes and projects that they support. So there's flyers that are going to be passed around later, later that have the address for, uh, for our fundraising page there. And also we have our newsletter, our news digest that Anne, <laughs> sorry, I forgot to introduce Anne. Oh, this is Anne. I'm busy, our, uh, Research and Communications Coordinator at the ICLMG. She's also live streaming tonight's event. Uh, um, I should mention that as well, that tonight's event is live streamed. Um, hopefully that's, we mentioned in, in, in the uh, program, so hopefully that's okay with everyone, that it'll be, that any questions will be live streamed as well, and, and, it, and it is recorded, so it'll be posted later on, so just so everyone knows and is comfortable uh, with that. Um, but as I was saying, oh yeah, okay. Kevin's going to pass around the flyers with information about uh, the ICLMG. Um, and we produce a weekly news digest that is a roundup of human rights and national security issues across Canada and internationally. And we'd encourage everyone to sign up for that as well. You can sign up with our sign up sheet that we'll pass around as well, or by going on our website. I think that's everything I want to say as an introduction. And you, did you have anything you wanted to? No, it's okay. No? Okay. <laughs> So then, without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce our speakers, um, and then they'll each uh, speak for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussion uh, for the rest of the time that we have tonight. So directly to my left is Michael Vaughn. Uh, Michael is a lawyer and has been the policy director of the BCCLA, the uh, British Columbia Civil Liberties Association, since 2004. Um, she has been an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia where she has taught civil liberties and information ethics. 
and she is a regular guest instructor for UBC in their HIV AIDS center. Oh, sorry, in HIV AIDS care. Um, she has been honored for her work in HIV AIDS with both an Alkalades Award and a Red Ribbon Award, and she is a recipient of the 2015 Keith Sacre Library Champion Award for support, guidance, and assistance given to the BC Library Committee. Ms. Vaughn is a frequent speaker on a variety of civil liberties topics, including privacy, national security, policing, surveillance, and free speech. Uh, she is currently a collaborator on Big Data Surveillance, a multi-year pro research project uh, led by Queen's University. And uh, she is an advisory board member of Ryerson University Center for Free Expression and advisory board member for Privacy International. Uh, next to Michael is Paul Champ. Uh, Paul is a litigation lawyer with a focus on human rights, employment, uh, employment, labor, and public interest law. And Paul has developed a practice in national security law and has acted as counsel on several important, important constitutional law cases dealing with fundamental human rights, including the settlement of Benamar Benetta, uh, rendered to the U.S. by Canadian officials and imprisoned for five years without charges, the case of Abdul Razak v. Minister of Foreign Affairs, in which the court ruled that, can, that uh, Canadian government officials violated a Canadian citizen's charter rights by arranging for his unlawful detention by Sudanese authorities and refusing to provide a passport. And the case of Canada v. Qatar uh, from 2008, which found that uh, Canadian government officials violated the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms by interrogating a Canadian youth detained by the US in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, and last but not least is Tamir Israel. Uh, he joined the Samuel, Samuelson Gushko Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic, CIPIC, as a staff lawyer after articling with the clinic. Um, he conducts research and advocacy on various digital rights related issues with a focus on online privacy and anonymity, net neutrality, intellectual property, intermediary uh, liability, electronic surveillance, spam, e commerce, and internet governance generally. His advocacy activities have taken him before the courts various regulators, parliamentary committees, and international internet govern governance fora. Prior to joining CIPIC, Tam uh, Tamir received a JD from the University of Toronto and a BA from the University of British Columbia. He's also a member of the Advisory Board of Privacy International and lectures on international regulations um, at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. Um, before I hand it over to Michael, one thing I do want to mention is just this past week, some of you may have seen it, but we uh, we, along with uh, the BCCLA and CIPIC, uh, I don't think, Paul, did you sign on to the open letter too? Did we send that to you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> along with Paul, <laughs> uh, issued an open letter. There were uh, just under 40 organizations and individuals that issued an open letter um, uh, stating their con our concerns with Bill C-59 and that it does not go far enough in addressing the human rights concerns that C-51 brought about and human rights concerns generally in our our national security activities, um, and so I'm sure uh, we'll be able to we'll be touching on the, those issues tonight. Um, so, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Michael. Thanks, Tim. Thanks so much, and it feels so talk showy up here, quite like this. Um, when Bill C-51, and I'm going to call it that because that's how we all branded it, right? When Bill C-51 came out. We're a civil liberties organization. What we need to do is say what is bad policy, what is constitutional, what is good for civil liberties. We have an array of things that we might discuss in such a large, comprehensive, expansive national security bill. And if there was something that we thought was permissible or perhaps good security policy, we would hive that off from what we said was problematic. The entirety of Bill C-51 did not pass muster with us, the entirety. If there was something that we could have given a, a heads up to or a, tilted our cap to, we would have, but there was simply not anything that was good policy and good law and rights protective. So we were very critical of that and when we were anxious to see what kind of remedies we might have um, although the remedy that we called for was complete repeal. Please repeal this and please give us your new version fresh. Don't tinker with the problems that we find in Bill C-51 because they are too fundamental, we said, for tinkering. And I, I think our position uh, on 
the new legislation is that that tinkering is proving as unsatisfactory as we feared that it would. Um, I want to walk you through, because I have only a few minutes, we've got kind of preliminary remarks to kind of cover the waterfront. And remember how big this waterfront is. It's 150 pages worth of waterfront, right? So there's a lot to discuss, and so we're trying to make sure that we um, perhaps get a little bit into the weeds with specific questions, but don't kind of get too nitty gritty to sort of understand um, the overview. I want to cover three areas um, and then pass, a, pass along the, uh, the torch. I want to talk about the um, revisions to the um, terrorism speech offense. I want to talk about the information sharing uh, provisions. And I want to talk about um, the no-fly list. So just quickly, because it's the easiest one, terrorism speech offense. So the terrorism speech offense that was brought in by C-51, you may recall, um, involved some of the language that we had simply just never seen in the national security realm before. We had a criminalization of speech in relation to the promotion of terrorism in general. Now we ask lawyers all across the country, what the hooey does that mean? Nobody knew, right? We'd never seen language like that before, and when the government, during the Green Paper, consultation process, national security consultation process, um, that they had promised us, finally provided a justification for why they had gone about this. I gotta say, tell me if anybody understood the justification, because I, I didn't get it. It was just actually quite weird. Um, so never understood the convoluted um, rationale for this. Granted, they were making a rationale for legislation that wasn't theirs, so um, they, they made up something it didn't sound very good, and they have obviously decided to do a very substantive revamp on this. So we now have a terrorism speech offense that is tied to counseling, um, which is, a um, again, a known entity in law in relation to these kinds of speech offenses, taking away some of the most egregious aspects of the previous speech offense, which was so unmoored from um, protection for expressive freedom, that it um, didn't even have a defense for private speech, right? In the current, I, I was gonna say in the old, but it's merely the current um, terrorism speech offense, you can have, be having an entirely private conversation. There is no requirement that you even broadcast these views, right? So it's a very, very broad and sweeping, and we said, chilling, and also security undermining bill, right? You have a government that is very keen on de-radicalization processes in which having an honest or candid discussion about your views could actually find you in a position to be criminally liable. Well, obviously that's not going to work. So this has been substantially revamped and I think probably now constitutional, but it begs the question whether or not we needed it Right? We have very extensive, arguably, um, speech offenses in relation to terrorism, facilitation, etc. There are a number of offenses that could apply. Did we need this one? I'm not sure that we did. Um, but that it is a substantial improvement over the last one, which was um, nothing is assuredly unconstitutional, but surely um, was going to be problematic and deeply challenged. Uh, that is not, not on the table anymore. So. I don't know, I'm not going to give things a grade, but that one probably passes for what it's worth. Um, again, not that we're enthusiastic about it, but it probably passes constitutional muster. The next is um, what was arguably at the heart of those many, many people that Tim was talking about, thousands of people out in the streets protesting C-51, which was the surveillance capacity um, that was embedded in what was then the Security of Canada Information Sharing Act, which has now been rebranded in C-59. It's now the Security of Canada Information Disclosure Act, not sharing, we're disclosing. Looking to narrow, looking to tighten, um, and in some ways it does. So again, there's something to be said for this. But I think the caution that we want to extend here is it doesn't narrow it very, very, very much. It does, there, there is something good about the new Information Sharing Act, but only as compared to the old one, 
right? The old, the old question of feminist analysis, oh, it's compared to what, right? Um, so compared to what? Compared to C51, yes, we've seen a narrowing, and that is good. But I think the important thing to hang on to here is these governmental entities were always governed by the Privacy Act. We have always had exceptions in the legislation for the kind of targeted sharing that you would do when you have a, um, a suspect or someone of particular interest. It has long been our contention, and C-59 does nothing to remedy this, that what the new information sharing or disclosure um, acts um, have done, essentially, is give sanction to a much broader range of information sharing. Nothing stops any more in C-59 than in C-51 the disclosure of entire databases for analysis and analytics, which again is the new security modality, right? Again, population-based surveillance in which you're looking for as much data as you can ram into the diagnostics and the analytics for your, um, for your security assessment. So that kind of, again, suspicionless um, grab, grab all is still entirely within what C-59 endorses, although they've taken away some of the most gobsmacking, jaw-dropping um, kinds of language that we saw in the last one where, you may recall, I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding like, I remember that from C-51, yes, yes. So you may recall in C-51, the, the catch-all for the information disclosure or sharing, for the, for the handing over of information from one governmental entity to another, was the question of whether the activities, if it related to activities in relation to the undermining of security, national security. Again, language we were unfamiliar with. The usual language would be threatening, not undermining. What does undermining mean? What is the threshold for undermining? Well, they gave a list of activities some of which they said these activities include um, activities in relation to these realms. And the, the realms had nothing to do with national security. They were about public life in general, like economic and financial stability of Canada, like the administration of justice, like infrastructure, like massive. And so all kinds of people were very, very, very nervous about some of these. And these have been they truly have been um, narrowed and sometimes modified. So, for example, on that list of acts, so they use the same language, activities that undermine, um, so that's still intact. But in that long list, some of them have gone. Economic and financial stability has gone. Administration of justice has gone. That's good. Interference with infrastructure, critical infrastructure, has remained but now has a modifier on it um, to suggest, what is the modifier? Is it significant and systematic? I think it's widespread. Widespread and systematic, is that it? Or, yeah. So it now has a modifier. Um, again, is that going to be sufficient to not um, chill or concern um, unions in relation to telecommunications who are worried about wildcat strikes being interpreted as dot, dot, dot? Um, environmentalists worried about what would otherwise be um, um, could be acts of civil disobedience in relation to critical infrastructure, dot, dot, dot. Is that sufficient that it has a modifier? Um, uh, I am not confident that it's um, sufficient, but it does, again, attempt a narrowing there. So those are, those are important considerations to understand that we do have an improvement, but Again, the question is, when push comes to shove, how much of an improvement do we have? And much will depend on, again, how much is getting hoovered up in um, the kinds of whole, wholesale database ingestion that we now know through things like um, CERC's first ever audit of the CSIS bulk data holdings are very, very much underlying much of the, um, of the in, uh, intelligence, national security intelligence, as we know it today, right? It's not national security intelligence in, in the yesterday framework, it's the, it's the wholesale ingestion of databases and what that means. 
So um, moving quickly to NoFly, NoFly, NoFly is a problem of such fundamental import. I mean, here we have um, something that has never been demonstrably able to uh, give us any indication that flying is safer on the basis of what would essentially be a watch list, right? A watch list that we're very familiar with in a national security context. But when we, we really think this through, or not even, not even really think it through, even at first blush, right? We have to appreciate that this is all happening, this watch listing is happening on the basis of bureaucratic logics and risk logics that have no penalty for over-inclusion, right? So the way the bureaucratic logics work is if I am the person or department responsible for putting people on the no-fly list, nothing bad happens to me if I include y'all in the room and none of you should have been on it. Nothing bad happens to me. Bad things happen to you, but nothing bad happens to me. Only if I miss somebody does bad things happen to me. So what's gonna happen? The bureaucratic logics for the bloating of these lists, the over-inclusions of these lists, and again, how you go about getting yourself off of the list when everything about your listing, or so much of what's gonna be about your listing, is gonna be subject to national security privilege. You end up in a very, very dark place especially when you consider that there's no evidence that we're making anybody safer through the usage of this. So the kinds of things, again, just tinkering that have happened to the no-fly lists are very disappointing. One of the things that we pointed out to the minister and in consultation is there are other ways of keeping people who shouldn't be on airplanes off of airplanes. You can get court orders that do that. In which case, take your evidence to the judge, right? And you have a process whereby something is being independently adjudicated. Not a secret mission happening through in kind of the executive branch that is completely opaque. And in terms of uh, a process in which you're going to try to in extract your due process rights is going to be very challenging. So we're disappointed that we still have essentially a tinkered with no-fly list. And on that tinkered list, we have a few things that are different now. One of the things that is different is that there is a longer period of time in which you cannot be responded to by the minister when you say, hey, I shouldn't be on this list. Oh, I should clarify first, there are two lists. Or this is the way we explain it because it's a little easier. We call it the no-fly list when you're not able to get on an airplane and the slow fly list when you're subjected to increased security. So those children that you keep hearing about who have had missed flights, et cetera, et cetera, in the main, they're on the slow fly list, meaning that, they're, um, that they are subjected to increased scrutiny, which very often results in them not being able to catch the flight in time. That list still remains, despite the pressure that has been created, on the government to address this because of the no-fly kids, that list still effectively you have no recourse rights to. There's an office, which I understand is a phone, that will ring and somebody will get back to you, maybe eventually, to tell you that there is not very much that they can do. That is your recourse, as I understand it at this juncture, for the, no, the slow-fly list. For no-fly, you can make a request that, the, uh, that your um, listing be reconsidered. And the, the, you, the, the onus that existed in C-51 is if I make a request to take my name off of no-fly and the minister ignores me for 90 days, I am deemed to remain on the list. Right? How's that for due process? Right? Um, current, the, the new proposal is that the minister would have 120 days. However, if I am ignored in that 120 days, I am deemed to have been delisted. So essentially the government has a longer period of time, but they must act. They can't just not act and have you continue as being listed. However, if any time during that 100 days the minister should request more information, we get another 120 days whacked on there. Okay, so this is a situation in which by this time, if you need to travel for your work, you've lost your job, you've not been able to go where you need to go to do whatever you've needed to do, etc., etc. But then 
it remains, the process is one of which you've got to eventually, almost assuredly, find yourself in a court in which you are going to have great difficulty arguing in the black box of not knowing what exactly the case is against you to meet. So again, some tinkering here to try to um, change some of the um, um, process considerations that had been critiqued, but certainly nothing fundamental that gets to the heart of, do we do need this? What would be appropriate policy to deal with if we do need it? And why aren't we using any of those alternate mechanisms that so clearly exist? Um, never an answer to those questions. And that is, uh, that's the situation with C-59. I'm gonna pass it on to Paul. Or to me. Thank you, Take it, go ahead. Uh, um, so, I mean, so I wish I could say I had good news to follow on Michael's uh, uh, finale there, but um, I'm going to be talking about our intelligence agencies, which is rarely great news, but um, um, okay, so uh, the challenge is that, uh, C so C-59 overhauls um, the framework for one of our intelligence agencies, uh, Communication Security Establishment. It's our version of the NSA, if you guys are more familiar with uh, that agency. Um, and it uh, carries out similar activities, mostly in the electronic context, so they're rarely actively showing up at people's doors, but um, these days, of course, you can do quite a bit from the comfort of your own internationally integrated uh, surveillance network. Um, and uh, CSIS is the other agency, which is our more active um, uh, human intelligence agency that historically has um, been primarily limited to gathering intelligence through the use of human sources. Um, so many of the problems that, many of the uh, mechanisms that C-59 puts in place uh, with respect to these two agencies are seek to address problems that were not necessarily introduced by Bill C-51, but have been kind of longer standing problems. Um, and uh, um, with the exception of one, which I'll just mention briefly at the outset and come back to at the end. So um, C-51 introduced um, a power that allowed CSIS to undertake active activities. So historically, uh, many of you will remember this, but um, we had some issues in Canada where the RCMP, maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, was the agency that had the primary responsibility for addressing national security issues, and uh, they basically, there was a major inquiry. Um, the activities that they would undertake in, the, um, in, in their, in their um, active national security mandate to prevent national security activities were um, egregious beyond any acceptable measures in a democratic society. Uh, there was a famous barn burning where they burned down a farm where political activists were going to meet. Um, there was uh, um, just many really egregious, egregious things. <clears throat> uh, at the end of this inquiry that was launched into RCMP's um, uh, more egregious conduct, it was concluded that uh, this eight, that we need to split off national security um, from active policing. Uh, and since that time in Canada, we've had the RCMP, which basically investigates criminal criminal offenses, you know, uh, things that we're familiar with, um, murder, uh, 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 robbery, terrorism as well, which is a national security related offense, but um, is a very confined, um, a much more confined set of, um, they, they focus their investigations around criminal activities, basically, like a specific act of terrorism. And we had CSIS, which was a new agency which was created at the time, uh, to gather intelligence so that we can proactively assess threats, but they operated under a much broader mandate of uh, just general uh, information awareness and threat assessment. So their investigations and their activities aren't tied to specific activities, but just um, they can do basically roughly what, what is needed to address security matters. Um, but their ability to act was taken away. That was entrusted to the RCMP. So only when an actual criminal act was going to be engaged um, does the uh, police get to act. And this is how we've mitigated um, the more, some of the more egregious conduct that uh, tends to come about when you give an agency a fairly open-ended mandate and the ability to act on it in a national security context. 
Um, so C51 restored this active uh, tectonic, as it was has been uh, labeled by some some people, um, powers to Cesis. Um, it, and it, it was framed as this uh, one again. It, the power was framed as uh, the the ability to essentially disrupt activities um, related to national when when deemed necessary in relation to a national security um, a national security uh, concern. Um, national security or threat to national security. Threat to national security was defined a little bit better than uh, in um, the than than the broad category list of categories that uh, Michael mentioned, but it was still fairly open ended and it leaves a fair amount of discretion. Um, CSIS was explicitly told it can't uh, uh, murder people or interfere with their sexual integrity, basically rape them. Um, but other things were left to uh, uh, like fairly open ended in terms of what they can do. Um, um, uh, this could, in theory, include things like detention uh, um, uh, um, on, on the cyber, in the digital context. It can include things like breaking into websites, putting up false information on behalf of other people, um, disrupting communication networks where uh, individuals are discussing political activities that, under CSIS, as a user, are considered to be a threat. It's fairly open-ended. Um, uh, maybe it's not likely that we would get the same uh, overt bar barn burning activities that we got in the um, uh, before uh, the RCMP was stripped of their mandate, but we would likely get digital barn burning. So the digital barn being the blog or the communications network where people are gathering, and the burning being the um, uh, malware inserted on their servers that would delete their uh, just uh, delete the uh, make, make the communications network either completely. Uh, um, inoperable for a short period of time or even longer term. Um, okay, so that, that's what C51 introduced. Um, so, bef uh, and, but when, but with, and then, um, and in, with respect to CSE, uh, C51 didn't do too much with respect to CSE's activities um, because CSE as an agency has already largely developed uh, their own capabilities in secret over the last 20 years. Um, Operating under some restrictions, but not many, and mostly in secret and under not very much transparency. So, um, so C51 didn't add too much overtly to their capabilities. Um, but um, in in the in the uh, um, particularly following the Snowden revelations, where a lot of information came out regarding the activity or con was confirmed regarding the activity of our national security agencies, um, including the NSA, but also CSE to some degree. Uh, it became evident that CSE's, uh, what it was, the, the activities it had undertaken uh, upon itself were maybe perhaps um, not exactly what some people had envisioned uh, they were interested with doing. Uh, so the, this, so C-59 uh, responded both to, to some, in some degree, attempts to respond both to the more troubling, some of the more tra troubling aspects that uh, arose from granting CSIS this new ability to disrupt activities and interfere with, uh, actively interfere with, um, with, uh, with, um, with individuals, um, and also to long-standing problems with CSE. So I'm going to so, uh, so with respect to CSE in particular, C59 does introduce some positive changes, including introduce some clarity. So um, what happened in the um, Late stages of the Cold War was that C and in the early stages of the internet, um, as communication network became way more far more integrated and the world became a much smaller place on the digital side, uh, CSE um, was given a legal framework for the first time, and this was in the um, this is in uh, uh, maybe about uh, this is in early two thousand. Um, where, where it, was, um, it was basically given a fairly blank check to do surveillance as long as it was directing its activities at non, not, at, not at Canadians. Now, um, and that's pretty much the, the, the context that we have for what CSE was up to. Um, now, what this, what this has been interpreted by CSE over the years with the, uh, some input from a, an oversight commissioner is that um, CC can basically direct its activities at the internet, um, which is a very broad uh, ecosystem um, that has a lot of people in it and only a few Canadians, 30 million, not that many really when you look at the internet uh, writ large, um, and uh, collect as much data as it can from the internet, but 
and if it sweeps up 30 million Canadians' data alongside with uh, the other uh, billions of people's data that's out there, um, that's okay. So, um, uh, so, so basically, uh, CSE has has developed an, an operational infrastructure that's very integrated with the NSAs and uh, their counterparts in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, that. Uh, that basically has monitoring points throughout the entire internet and is just like actively collecting information from the internet as it like basically they collect as much as they can grab, analyze it over a short period of time, keep as much as they can hold, and, uh, and then use it as, as necessary. CUC's primary restriction up until C59 was that um, as, as we were saying that it couldn't direct its activities at Canadians and where it was analyzing Canadians data um, it, it needed to be a little bit, um, uh, it, it would need to basically um, suppress Canadians' identities. But it was still able to actually um, look at what Canadians were doing. And we saw through the Snowden revelations some of the applications of this. So CSE would uh, look at, um, would, would pick some, you know, would look at file upload sites uh, like Scribd or, say, Dropbox. Um, uh, identify diff different files that were interest to them, and then keep track of any any IP address and any and any individual attached to it who accessed those documents. We don't know by what criteria. Uh, we don't have a clear idea by what criteria they decide which documents these are, um, but we, they do it kind of on mass. Um, and then if you get hit within that, if you get hit, if you uh, if you end up being one of the people who accesses these documents, whether Canadian or not. Um, then uh, that could uh, elevate you to a higher level of suspicion and, um, and, and you get flagged within, uh, within CSE's um, uh, operational um, uh, mechanisms as someone who may, may require more, more, more intense viewing and they have other mechanisms that can kick, that can kick in. And the more you get elevated, the more um, mechanisms uh, kick in. Um, including those of, of some of our partners. So CAC, for example, is able to ask GCHQ to use one of its programs that basically intercepted all video chats on one of one of the um, one of the uh, um, one of the video, uh, video uh, digital uh, voice over IP uh, providers, not Skype, but a, a different one. Um, and uh, if you were already at a point where uh, you were of interest to CSC, they would be able to plug your, um, your IP address or some other identifier that they had of you and see if you had any video chats associated with you and, and take a look at them. Now, um, out of the data set that was obtained by Snowden through, from the NSA, uh, the Washington Post, I believe, did an analysis of, of, the, of the type of data that was being held in there. And they found that there was immensely sensitive data about people's health information, uh, their, you know, their sexual preferences, their religious views, it, like non-public information that was coming off of their emails or their other interactions. Um, and, that, and they found that uh, a roughly, um, I can't remember the exact ratio, but roughly uh, one in 10 of the, the people whose data sets were kept by the NSA in, this, in, the, in, their, uh, in their data holdings was an actual target of the NSA. The rest was just data that was just collected from the internet um, generally and just held uh, for in case it was needed one day. Um, and and we, we don't know because we don't have as many details about what CSC was doing, but CSC has access to the same databases that the NSA uh, has collected and, um, and uh, has its own in addition to supplement them. Um, so, okay, so mass surveillance, basically. Um, so, so now, so turning to C59 now, uh, C59 provides some clarity in that it starts to specifically encode some of these specific um, things that uh, CSE has been doing for a while. Um, it does actually say, you know, CSE is allowed to basically in, intercept, uh, inject itself into um, internet point, like key points around the internet, and basically intercept in an untargeted way any data that goes through there. Um, and then it imposes some restrictions on what it can keep. Um, these restrictions are mostly with respect to Canadians, so not with respect to non-Canadians. Um, the issue, uh, of course, though, um, uh, it has to first make an assessment of what, uh, often the way that um, CSE operates is it may not assess 
so, um, like it may not look at the data too closely as it's bringing it in and holding it, uh, it may just keep it, and um, so it may not know, for example, that this IP address belongs to someone in Canada, but only later on when it's running an analysis, you know, where did, where did, this, IP, where did this person travel with this phone that was generating this IP address? Uh, what files did this person download? What, um, what websites did this IP address visit? Only at that point will it determine that this is actually a Canadian person. So a lot of Canadian data gets kept under this infrastructure, under this mechanism, but also a lot of foreign data, which is uh, also a concern. Um, so all of that is not clearly spelled out that CSC can do these things. It expressly, the, the law expressly says you can mass target uh, data foreigners. Um, so that type of clarity is useful at the very least because it helps with uh, core challenges. You don't need to wait till a whistleblower provides you the documents that show like, what they're doing before you can challenge it in court because it says it right there in the law. Um, but, um, and, and then uh, um, another addition which is useful is that uh, C59 requires um, CSEs, what's that? Oh, just just three, three minutes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, requires that uh, CSEs activities be proportionate in what they're taking in uh, and necessary. So um, this is, again, a requirement that wasn't there before. They used to not even need to consider if, what, if, the, if their surveillance activities were proportionate to their objective. They would just sweep it all in. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but again, it specifically encodes in the law that it is proportionate to just grab all the data as long as you don't keep it, keep Canadian data for too long, or are a little bit careful with how you use Canadian data. So it, it encodes, it, it's good that CS, the, the C59 encodes this concept of proportionality, but the problem is it defines it in a way that's really uh, not pro inherently non-proportionate. Um, a last thing that the C59 does with respect to CC, which is positive, is it imposes the, uh, it includes a, the, an information commissioner, which I think Paul will talk about a bit more, Who's, uh, who's allowed to um, basically tell, tell CSC no, they can't do certain things. This is again something that CSC has not had historically. They had a minister who's, who, both, who set their objectives and also was responsible for determining what they couldn't, couldn't, couldn't do. Um, very, it was basically the fox uh, uh, guarding the, the, hen, the hen coop. Um, now there is a judicial officer there who can tell them no if they're doing something that the judicial officer feels is too, too extreme. But um, uh, again, the, the, the commissioner doesn't operate in secret and uh, there's not a lot of opportunity to inject, um, to inject, for, for, uh, to inject other opinions other than CSEs into its considerations. Um, finally, uh, so, so th those are the good uh, additions to that C59 provides for CSE. Um, the bad is that uh, it still allows mass surveillance uh, expressly. It, it actually opens up even more exceptions for uh, gathering of Canadian data that weren't there before. One being, whereas historically CSC would have to get authorization at least from the minister, the fox guarding the hen who, if it wanted to con collect uh, Canadian data overtly or um, incidentally, um, CSC is now allowed to collect any publicly available data, including that of Canadians. But publicly available data is defined as uh, anything that's, that you can purchase. And that includes, for example, um, there's mass data brokers in the US that harvest data from Facebook, um, private data from Facebook and other social networks that can then, um, CSC can just purchase this and, and uh, without, it, without any limitations at all, other than on retentions and use. Um, and then also uh, CSC, and, and this is a, and CSIS has a comparable, a comparable issue here because um, Michael talked about a recent decision where CSIS was found by the federal court to be holding um, a, a mass amounts of data on Canadians that the court um, said it was holding illegally because it didn't need this data for any any reasonable for any any reason. Um, uh, the C59 uh, alters this this regime for CSIS and tells it that it's allowed to keep data even if it doesn't need it, um, as long as it might likely be, it might be useful kind of one day down the road. Um, this includes data that CSIS obtains through uh, the bill that Michael was talking about on uh, uh, through, uh, through the Security Information Disclosure Act now, so from other departments of the government. Um, it could be information on protesters, it could be information on, um, on, uh, on dissidents, um, it, could be, um, it could be anything really and, uh, and they could keep it. Um, CSIS as well uh, uh, Retains its disruption powers that are a little bit narrower, but they're still allowed to act to disrupt um, to disrupt both uh, both individuals. They're allowed to detain individuals on their own, um, 
uh, and they're allowed to um, uh, disrupt uh, communications networks. CSE is also now empowered to go into to disrupt communication networks, to disrupt communications in transit, so they can actually um, they have uh, capabilities that will let them interject themselves between conversation and two people and add even words to make one person think the other person was saying something else. Um, they're, they're, they're able to knock out communication network, as I was talking about before, where uh, political discussions are happening. Um, they could interfere with, potentially, with foreign elections, which is something that we know that a lot of agencies are increasingly doing um, around the world. Um, and uh, um, uh, there's... So yeah, just maybe to summarize, um, <laughs> there's a lot of more clarity in there, a lot more uh, consider room for considerations of proportionality, but the bill itself, um, what it envis envisions as proportionate is uh, fairly problematic in and of itself. So there's a concern that, um, well, basically that Michael's gonna have to launch another charter challenge, I think, to sort it out again. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll start with Paul. <laughs> Uh, is the is the mic microphone essential for the online stuff? Or? Uh, I think it it helps. Okay. Yeah, you you, you, you prefer don't want to use it, it or I just I don't know. I can probably speak to it, but I'll, I'll do my best. I would just like to start by thanking the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group for uh, hosting this event and inviting me. I've uh, followed and uh, worked with the ICLMG for over ten years now. And uh, they're fulfilling a function that uh, I don't think any other group really is in the sense that they're focusing on these national security activities that the government is doing. And in the wake of 9-11, uh, I think it's you know, far more important and crucial than ever. And I'd like to thank the, both the panel members. I always learn something new whenever I uh, listen to Michael speak and uh, Tamir as well. Um, but most importantly, I'd just like to thank uh, the audience, both online and here, because these issues, these national security issues, uh, are hard to follow because uh, the government wants it all done in secret. And they're saying, trust us, right? They're saying, trust us. And uh, I have an interest in these issues, uh, not simply as a lawyer, but as a citizen, because I think uh, it's our role as citizens to challenge the government. And uh, more significantly, we know there have been so many abuses uh, and mistakes and uh, human rights violations over the last 15 years that uh, are outrageous and that uh, the government, or at least the responsible agencies, have tried to evade responsibility, uh, avoid apologizing, avoid acknowledging their mistakes. Um, you know, I, I like to say sometimes uh, being a CSIS officer means never having to say you're sorry uh, because if you ask them, they've never made any mistakes. They've never done anything wrong. And I'll tie that into my talk, uh, my little piece here. I'm just going to talk about the review and oversight of these bodies. Uh, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service primarily, uh, but also the Communication Security Establishment and to, to a certain extent the RCMP as well. Um, because uh, the, the bodies that we have now have in some cases concluded and found, of course, that CSIS has uh, broken the law, has violated charter rights, but in almost none of those circumstances, and I say almost just to be in some fairness because I can't think of one instance off the top of my head where CSIS has ever acknowledged or admitted that they've made a mistake in their national security activities. And that, that should be a flag right there, right? Uh, that should be a flag right there. But um, the piece I'm gonna talk about here is review and oversight. What do we do to maintain oversight of these national security bodies? And um, ju just so we understand how or why that's so important, I'd just like to explain at the beginning the difference between uh, intelligence and law enforcement. Um, Tamir did a good job of, of explaining it a bit, and I'd just like to, to go over that a bit just so we understand uh, how important it is. So uh, with, with a law enforcement investigation, that's the police, right? And so their investigations are very target-oriented, objective-oriented, and that's a prosecution. They're trying to find evidence that a crime was committed, and then they want to prosecute it. So there's a natural arc to their investigation. Intelligence investigations by CSIS and CSEC, or Communication Security Establishment, are inherently open-ended. They don't have a particular objective. They can investigate people for years and years and years because they're not looking for one uh, endpoint. It's just, well, this person's kind of suspicious. 
This person talks to people that we think are suspicious. We think this person travels to places that we think is, thinks are suspicious, that says things that we, you know, challenges government policies that we don't like. So uh, those investigations may never come to an end. The second important feature of national security investigations or intelligence investigations versus law enforcement is that they're completely secret and have uh, almost no oversight or scrutiny. Whereas law enforcement investigations, police investigations, while they might uh, you know, be covert while they're being carried out, if, they're going to be pro if there's going to be a prosecution, the conduct of the police are you know, laid bare before the courts. We have a very vigorous uh, court system. Uh, criminal defense lawyers and judges, where we find uh, where the police has misconducted themselves, uh, violated rights, and, and we see and hear about the abuses and mistakes and errors of police on a regular basis. You don't hear about that for CSIS or for CSEC, the Communications Security Establishment, and that's because what they do is completely in secret. And so um, that's why uh, oversight and review of these national security bodies is so important because what they do is almost completely in secret and their, their activities are almost never uh, exposed to judicial scrutiny. Um, you know, and, and what we do know is that when someone is acting in secret, particularly governments act in secret, that's an invitation for abuse. You know, abuses are inevitable. Um, they're human beings like anyone else. We have so many news stories about uh, mistakes or, or abuses by police, right? Like almost every day. Do you think the CSIS are perfect? They're not, right? Of course they're not. Of course there's mistakes. Um, but, uh, and, and also, you know, there's no whistleblowers, and I'll talk about this as well. There's laws that prevent CSIS agents themselves. When they see what's going wrong, wrong, there's no mechanism for them to blow the whistle. Um, they can't go to a reporter, they can't go to a politician, uh, they can't go to the Public Sector Integrity Commission, which is a mechanism that's set up. They can't go to the Security Intelligence Review Committee, they can't. So um, there's uh, f so few areas where they can go. So what has led to these changes that are now in C-59, this new bill? Bill C-59, uh, in addition to uh, dealing with a lot of these substantive issues that uh, Michael and Tamir have so well laid out, uh, from C-51, it addresses a new thing, and that is oversight and review of these bodies. Uh, this is one of the big things the Liberals were saying was wrong with C-51. Oh, there's just not enough oversight and review. And uh, that's true. It was very true. Um, and so that was one thing they were going to address. Um, what we've seen in this bill is positive in, in one big way, is that it follows up on recommendations that were made by Justice O'Connor. Uh, some of you may recall he was the commissioner who uh, uh, conducted a public inquiry into the activities of RCMP and CSIS involving Meher Arar. So we all know uh, the, the findings of his major report in terms of what happened to Meher Arar. But he then did a second report that's less well known and less uh, spoken about. Uh, and that was uh, a report about what he felt there should be a new review mechanism for national security activities. What he said was that we have all these bodies of government out there uh, you know, not only RCMP, but we have CSIS, we have the Canadian Border Services Agency, we have Transport Canada, we have the Communication Security Establishment, and all these bodies are in some way or other uh, dealing with national security issues that may <coughs> impinge on civil liberties, but there's no one body that can look at all of them at once. And more than ever now, these bodies are acting in an integrated fashion. They're working together. They're sharing information back and forth. And even sharing information, obviously, with, with foreign governments. So when you try to find out what they're, what they're doing, none of the bodies that we had in existence at that time, in 2006, could really get to the bottom what, what might be going on in one individual's case. So, for example, the May Harar case, or the Abdullah Malki case, Amin Omadi and others, where we had the involvement of all of these agencies. Um, the, the bodies that we had in place at that time, or well, still today, which was the Security Intelligence Review Committee, uh, which looks into CSIS, uh, an intelligence commissioner, which looks into the uh, communication security establishment, and the civilian police complaints commission, which looks into RCMP activities. Um, whenever a complainant might say, oh, well, but then RCMP shared information with CSIS, uh, the civilian police complaints commission might go, oh, well, we can't look at that because that's CSIS. 
or when uh, the Security Intelligence Review Committee is looking at what CSIS has done, let's say, with uh, Abu Sufyan al-Dorazik and how and why he ended up being imprisoned by Sudanese intelligence agents and then was unable to come home afterwards to Canada, he was blocked from returning to Canada. Um, whenever it, it uh, the Review Committee looked at what were Canadian diplomats doing and what were their interactions with those CSIS agents and what were they telling each other, CERC would say, well, no, 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 we can't look at that. We don't have any mandated jurisdiction to look at foreign affairs. So uh, the recommendation, the fundamental recommendation of Justice O'Connor back in 06 was that we need some kind of integrated review mechanism. And, and uh, I can't uh, disagree with that. I think that was an excellent recommendation. Why it was ignored by uh, so many governments, uh, well, so many governments, two governments since then, uh, I, I can't understand. But this bill does do that. Uh, it creates a new agency called the National Security and Intelligence Review Agency, which is given the mandate and the power to look at any of these agencies, uh, singularly or in conjunction, uh, to get to the bottom of some of these uh, really difficult cases, or at least attempt to get to the bottom. So that's the good news um, out of this. Um, but uh, I'm going to, um, so a lot of people are going to say, I, you know, Paul's just going to tell you the good news. There's, you get the two bad news and then you get the good news. Um, I'm going to provide, and I told Tim before when I was invited, I, I told him, I said, well, I've got a little bit of a different view of these review bodies and their utility and how effective they are and how effective this new body might be. Uh, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I don't like them and I don't think they necessarily work very well. Uh, and so I'm going to give you a bit of my uh, views on that. And I speak from experience. I've appeared before the Security Intelligence Review Committee on a number of different cases. Uh, it's a very strange legal process. I've appeared before every kind of court and uh, committee and tribunal and commission uh, that you can imagine. Uh, but that CERC is uh, a beast unto itself. Um, it's got very strange processes and procedures that, in my view, doesn't uh, approach anything like due process. And the key thing to know about what C-59 does is um, it basically incorporates all the exact same powers and procedures that CERC has, that the Security Intelligence Review Committee has. They're all reproduced completely uh, in this bill. So basically, this is like a super CERC. It's, it's the Security Intelligence Review Committee as we have it now, but it just has a mandate now to look at all these other bodies, which is, which is good in that sense, but it doesn't deal with what I think are some of the fundamental problems um, with uh, CERC. And so if I could, I'll just... Um, talk to you a bit about uh, what I think are some of the problems with uh, both the, the existing CERC and with this new bill, the Security Intelligence, National Security Intelligence Review Agency. Um, but before I get into the details, I'll just, I'll, I'll say this. So the objectives of these review mechanisms, obviously, these review and oversight of um, nas these national security bodies is to, number one, ensure that these bodies are respecting uh, policies and directives and laws, including the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, right? That, that's supposed to be the number one uh, objective. The number two objective is to ensure accountability of those bodies to government, right? Because it's difficult for government to oversee these guys. It's really difficult. They, they you know, CSIS may have in a 10 year uh, period, like what, like six different or eight different ministers you think those ministers' offices can really get into and understand and oversee what that CSIS, what CSIS is doing? Often CSIS will just tell them what they're doing and if they say everything's okay, what's the minister to know different? Because you don't have those other sort of natural uh, accountability mechanisms that we have in society, which is like, uh, number one, like citizens, right? When things happen, people speak out about it. They'll go talk to the press or courts or the media, right? The media investigate the police. They investigate you know, whether uh, the Phoenix system, or they investigate, uh, you know, the EI system. They investigate our, our branches of government when they're making mistakes, because they can look into them. They can't do that with CSIS. It's a closed wall. We have a few dedicated reporters in, um, in Canada who, who will cover national security activities, but it is extremely difficult. The primary mechanism they have is access to information where they might get 500 documents and 90% and of them are blacked out. And because of their experience, they can kind of maybe tell you what's happening, right? You know, for example, just today we heard that Minister Goodale has come out with new uh, directives on the use of information uh, that may be derived from torture. 
Well, it's great that he announced that, uh, and I respect that, but the previous directives, which had been issued by then Public Safety Minister Vic Taves, when he had issued his directives, needless to say, he didn't hold a press conference. No one knew. No one knew. It was secret until Jim Bronskill from the Canadian press had filed an access to information request when he'd heard rumors and whispers that maybe there was a new directive out there, and then he got them, and it was him, almost two years after they'd been issued, that told Canadians that uh, Minister Taves had gone back on what had changed after the Aurora Inquiry. After the Aurora Inquiry, all the national security agencies stopped sharing information in any circumstances where they might be a risk of torture. They stopped, and they told uh, parliamentary standing committees that again and again and again. That was their new rule. But after a time, they found it constrictive. They didn't like it, right? They didn't like that. It, it, you know, it, it, there might be situations they might have to do it, right? And, and you know, and even asking the question sometimes of some of their intelligence partners, hey, did this information come from torture? That's you know, that's kind of impolite, right? You know, <laughs> so so they start speaking to their bosses and saying, let's change this. And at that time, they had a very I would say uh, um, a sympathetic ear and then Minister uh, Taves, right? And so he just made that change. And all of a sudden now they could share information and uh, where there might be a risk of torture and it was okay. So, but um, my point being is that we didn't learn that. We don't have that oversight. What we have right now then with the National Security uh, Intelligence Review Agency and the problems that we have is that, first of all, it's complaint driven, right? It's complaint driven. So again, you have that fundamental problem. If, if CSIS is investigating you and you don't know, how are you going to complain about it? Or with these new disruption powers, if uh, you, you uh, go home and your uh, girlfriend or your partner starts saying, hey, I hear you're having an affair and da da da, and it's like, oh, how do you find that? Well, someone sent me anonymous emails to disrupt your life. Well, how will you know that that came from CSIS? Or if you go to another country and you start being questioned when you land about all kinds of different things, how do you know that that came from CSIS? You won't necessarily know. Or if CSIS is going and speaking to your boss secretly, you might not know. So you have to find out in some way that they're doing something to you and to file your complaint in the first place. So that's a big problem. The second problem then is when you file this complaint and you go through with that process, it's conducted in private. That's what the old statute says, and that's what this new statute says. It's conducted in private. So first of all, the public can't come in here and listen and come up with their own views. Right? That's number one. Number two, CSIS can lead all of their evidence um, ex parte, where you're not there. Right? So they can tell the committee member anything they want, lead any kind of evidence, and you don't know what was said. Uh, and then third and finally, you get a report, a decision by the committee member to CERT, and it's just findings and recommendations. But those findings and recommendations are not binding in any way on, the, uh, on CSIS. And actually what we know, what history tells, what experience tells us, is more, almost all the time CSIS doesn't follow those recommendations. They will explicitly sometimes thumb their nose at, at CERT. Read those annual CERT reports and they'll have kind of like a, an overall glazed uh, version or summary of particular complaints and they'll say recommendations, but more often than not, they'll say CSIS didn't accept their recommendations. Right? That's why when I say you know, being CSIS means never having to say you're sorry. So there's no real teeth to it in that sense. And then the final thing is, as, a, as an individual, what on earth do you get out of it? What on earth do you get out of it? You, you pay for a lawyer if you can't find a lawyer to work for free. And I'll say out of the, all the cases that I've done, 80% of them I have done for free. But you get to the end, so you're, you, there's no reimbursement for your legal costs. And there's no compensation at the end. It's not if, if, if the CERC says, yeah, they, they, I think they did violate that guy's rights. You don't get anything back for that. There's CERC reports on Mayher Arar. You didn't get anything of that. There's a CERC report on Abu Simon Abdul Razik, not to mention a federal court judgment also saying that CSIS was complicit in his detention and torture, but no redress or compensation arising from that. So what's the point? Why do you even engage? Well, what the courts say is, well, that this is our accountability mechanism. By filing a complaint and engaging the mechanisms on the CERC, this is, this is like a public interest type of exercise to ensure accountability, to, to bring errors and mistakes and oversights to the attention of the government. And then they'll you know, maybe change their ways. But they don't. We already know right now, CERC has found again and again that they've been seriously misled by CSIS. 
That's not my words, those are their words. Seriously misled. That's the body that exists right now. There's nothing in this new body that's going to change that. They've misled the courts, right? You know, the, the case that, um, uh, that Michael was talking about, uh, where the court said that CSIS had deliberately crafted, crafted their evidence to mislead the court and keep the court in the dark. That was that court's judgment back in 2013. There was another judgment six months ago where all the federal court judges got together because they suspected that CSIS was misleading them again. And there is another uh, damning judgment out six months ago um, having to do with data retention where they were keeping these massive databases and not telling the judges that that's what they're doing with this information they're getting from warrants. Again, the court said, we're being misled. So we have these uh, repeated instances of human rights violations again and again and again. And you know, I could go through the, the list. I've mentioned a few, but there's others, but I'm sure most of us are aware of them. We've had situations where CSIS is misleading our existing body. And so now it's all in this new body where really its powers aren't any different. Uh, the final thing I'll say, I've got one case right now uh, where I, I, can't, I, I can't talk in, in more detail, but the, the current CERC member on this case has told us that um, it's so, what they say that they, he's interpreted this current CSIS Act, the current CERC legislation, that we can't tell people what our own witnesses told the committee. It's mm -hmm. all confidential, even after the report is done. We can't tell anyone what my submissions were. So I've got, I, I did 50 page written submissions, legal on the evidence and so forth. We're not allowed to share that with anyone. The, the report is finished. For all time, according to the CERC member, I, we have to keep that confidential. That's how he interprets in private. So we've now actually written the member to say, well, does that mean we can't release your, your decision? Is that we can't give the, share that with the public? That was three weeks ago. We still don't have an answer. So I wish I could even tell you <laughs> what that case was and what the findings were, but I can't. So how is that fostering trust in our national security agencies? It's not. And this new legislation has all those precise, exact same provisions. So we need a, a more effective, a stronger oversight body, uh, more adversarial with our national security agencies. Uh, they need power to make recommendations and findings, and some that are binding. They should be recommending that if your complaint is successful, your lawyer is paid for it. Let's just say the successful ones, right? I'm not going up there for fun. I'll do them for free if I get findings of uh, successful ones, because I can tell you, I get people that are coming to my office all the time that I think have valid complaints or concerns. With so um, right now, this legislation, while it, uh, C-59 is uh, curing one problem, uh, we will have integrated review of all of these bodies, and that's certainly a great thing. Um, I don't think it really meaningfully changes anything. Right now, it would have to be a very si special situation before I would advise a client to go to uh, this new body. Um, if we've got enough of a concern, I would say we go to court, because uh, engaging in that, those processes uh, it's, it's frustrating uh, to the individual, um, it's frustrating to counsel, and you ultimately won't get uh, the answers that you're looking for and the change that you deserve. Um, and that's what we need right now, is more answers, more accountability, more transparency to what these agencies are doing, especially when we're now best at them with these uh, more extraordinary powers than ever. So anyways. Uh, just can, thank you very much again, uh, Dice and OMG, and thanks everyone for coming to thinking about these issues, looking at them, and talking about them. So a huge thank you to our, our panelists. Thank you to, to, to Michael, Paul, and Tamir. Um, uh, I wanted to see, well, we'll go to questions very shortly. I wanted to see if there's anything as a final thought or before we go to questions that any of the, the speakers wanted to, to add uh, quickly before we go to questions or if uh, we should go straight to uh, seeing what people have to say. If you have let's, something to say about the Or if you have anything to say about what the others yeah, yeah, said. Yeah, sure, go for it. Well, if you're going to put it that way. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I thought was most shocking about reading um, the case Re-X, which has been discussing the lack of duty of candor, or the failure of the duty of candor of um, CSIS 
to the court. Um, and Cirque's report and the number of times where that failure of the duty of candor um, has appeared. Is that the court says and reacts something that we've never seen, I have never seen before, you again, I don't want to use hyperbole here, maybe it has existed before, but I've certainly never seen it. Where the judge, in a kind of a cri de cour, says, what is it going to take? Do we need to prosecute you for these breaches? Now we just never see that kind of language from the federal court judge, traditionally very deferential to concerns about national security. There is a kind of a throwing up our hands here about what do we do to bring this in line with the rule of law. And the disappointment for people, um, I think, around this is we see what C-59 does as, um, forgive me for being Cassandra-esque on this, but it wasn't easy, it wasn't hard to figure out that the government was gonna go here. Retroactively makes all of the breaches of law that CSIS did and was found to have done now legal. Right? So what do you get when you break the law and you're an ordinary citizen? You get prosecuted. What do you get if you're CSIS? You get new laws that say you can do it. Right? This is a problem. This is a problem around the culture that has grown up around the national security um, infrastructure in Canada that C-59 does nothing to remedy, in essence, because what we have is a model we did, we all clamored for. I say all in civil society here, we did clamor, and we do continue to clamor for genuine, meaningful review and oversight. Um, but when the mechanisms are so faulty that are simply getting spread around like a bigger puddle, you can see that we have, um, we have got a considerable amount of um, disappointment around what is likely to be our big shot at remedying some of these failures. Right? Um, we have had a national security consultation, which I just want to say, and again, in responding to this, I didn't say it off the top, and I really should have, was a shining moment for Canadians, stepping up on some very esoteric subject matter to make their voices heard, to get educated on some quite um, intricate um, pieces of policy and legislation, and to make a resounding cry, um, as we saw from the um, government's report on this, to say no, no, deeply concerned, must be fixed, um, concerns about surveillance and lack of ability to get at some of the things that we've been discussing were the top note, not just some people said X, some people said Y, the top note of the phenomenal response from Canadians to this consultation, and never before um, an unprecedented consultation. We've never asked Canadians about national security infrastructure, what do you think, right? So, um, so again, we, we don't want to be um, remiss in pointing out that there are some genuine um, improvements here. Um, but the question of what are we going to do faced with how um, paltry some of the tinkering is, um, that's, that's what we're looking at right now. That's the juncture that we're at. The bill will go to committee. They will be looking to hear um, from people in a kind of an expert testimony kind of way. But um, in terms of what's happening on the ground and the voice of ordinary Canadians making themselves heard, well, last year was the time. It looks like this year is the time still. So that's what I wanted to say in relation to that. I wanted to build on uh, Paul's point uh, of the secrecy and the, that Michael just picked up on as well that pervades a lot of the activities uh, in particular in relation to CSC and CSIS. So um, part of that, we're actually, people are trying to measure uh, how uh, more restrained individuals are in, um, in their willingness to seek out um, uh, you know, documents and, and uh, um, opinions online that represent kind of less popular views. 
uh, the more that they hear and learn about uh, how this information is monitored so pervasively and so secretly and then shared with other allies. I mean, it's bad enough what our agencies can do with this information. Like you might get list, you know, no fly listed just because you read the wrong document a couple of times or uh, showed up in a, in a location within you know, 100 meters of the wrong person a couple of times. Um, and, and this showed up, this, this set up some red flag on, on uh, an intelligence agency's database. But also, um, the, the minute someone gets flagged in, in our agency's databases, they're so integrated with those of our allies, um, the flag also gets sent uh, to other agencies that we're working with. Um, the administrations there are shifting all the time. Their, their priorities are shifting. Uh, we've seen recently a really big um, shift in how many people are getting flagged at the border for, for very, um, for things that most of us would consider to be uh, not, not really worthy of, uh, of getting re uh, rejected entry into a country. So for example, just uh, the Protestant Commissioner of Canada issued a report just last, uh, earlier this week, I think, or maybe last week, uh, where one of the issues that he flagged was uh, some a Canadian showed up at the border and was refused entry into the US just based because uh, they bit, because for health, for health reasons that had uh, uh, triggered a, um, a call, a 911 call. Um, uh, we've seen other examples where people have been turned back on religious grounds and, and political beliefs. Um, all like the the this this the invisible nature of this um, this information uh, apparatus that's being pervasively collected by these agencies, and uh, the secrecy around how it's being used and shared with other other countries and other agencies and what they're going to be doing with it, is uh, is really um, it's having a much more. Um, insidious effect now the more people learn about it so I just want to underscore that as well um, and Bill C59 I think leaves a lot of that intact unfortunately. Great well, well thanks again to all three of you that's it's really informative a lot of, a lot of information there I'm sure there's there's questions for, uh, from the audience and maybe go, go further on some of those. Um, I'll just mention that if people are watching online we'll also keep an eye on uh, Facebook to see if there's questions from online. And uh, si vous aimeriez poser des questions en français, c'est correct aussi, vous pouvez les poser en français et on va les traduire uh, pour les panélistes et pour les gens uh, sur uh, l'internet et les gens dans, dans la science. So, I think the first time I saw was back here, I think it's yours. Oh, okay. I don't know if the cord will stretch, we might just, oh, there we go. Yeah, you talked a little bit about the culture of CSIS. And I think not too long ago, some of the employees said that they found CSIS to be Islamophobic. And uh, what happened with that? <laughs> what, 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 do you cons yeah, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, um that was really, well, in some ways shocking, but I have to confess, uh, for me, it wasn't surprising. Um, you have to know that, like, again, when I was talking about police, uh, we've got all kinds of review mechanisms for them that are very public. So one big issue in Ottawa and Ontario, for example, is uh, carding, right? Where uh, we're, we're keeping data on how many people uh, the police are stopping and just collecting their information, and we're collecting the racial data of those people. And that data shows us that there's racial profiling going on, without a doubt, without a doubt. Can you imagine if we had that kind of data on CSIS, the people that they have targets on? Could we draw some conclusions from that if we had that data? For sure we would. Uh, I think that we uh, do have serious problems uh, with uh, our security intelligence agencies being uh, rife with people who have <coughs> racist uh, views. I've seen internal documents in some of my case, and some of my cases that shock me, where you know offhand comments about you know second-class citizens uh, or these are you know Canadians of convenience. Canadians convenience. Someone who's lived in this country for 25 years with Canadian children and so forth is a Canadian convenience. Or uh, in the uh, Abdullah Al Malki case, the emails going around that like shortly before they viewed him as oh, a very serious terrorist suspect because they had to tell their friends in the US that, is that they investigated him uh, intensively and concluded, oh, we don't see anything uh, here other than an Arab running around, right? And so on the other hand, they, they know that they should be start recruiting people of Muslim background, and we know that is happening, but then how is that working out for those individuals? Well, 
that lawsuit is what we're seeing. And uh, that lawsuit is, is uh, set out like completely shocking types of comments uh, and racist harassment uh, that would be unacceptable in any workplace in Canada. But especially in a workplace that's responsible for our national security, that's supposed to be clear-eyed, uh, in, uh, you know, intelligent analysis for our government to make policy decisions and in decisions on individuals who may be from those racial backgrounds, and yet there it is. I've got one, like I don't know the lawyer, uh, well I know the lawyer in the case, I don't know why they sued per se. I'll say here, I think they're going to have problems with that lawsuit because I think they're going to be prohibited from suing as um, employees. I think the CSIS Act requires them to file grievances on that. But here's the thing, if they filed those grievances, they'd have been completely secret. We would never know. We would never know that there are Muslim uh, employees of CSIS who experience racist harassment on almost a weekly basis. Right? And so there was enough of them, there was five of them, and they filed the lawsuit, which is public. And it's got that information out there for all of us now to know. Not to mention the minister, right? The minister of public safety now knows that. And who knows if he knew before? Because the director of CSIS was claiming, and I emphasize claiming, to the media, oh, I never knew about that. I never heard that. I don't buy it. I don't buy that for one second. But I think that's business as usual in that organization. And I think that lawsuit's really interesting because it provides... Uh, really an unprecedented window into the culture of that organization that, that many of us, I think, suspected and believed uh, was the case, but now we've got the evidence. This is not a very lawyerly thing to say, but I heard somebody mention this at the Info Summit just a couple of days ago in Vancouver, where they said, this is the, the, the phrase they use, they said, culture eats policy for lunch. And I've been thinking about that a lot ever since I heard it. And um, yeah, I think, um, you know, the, even what the neuroscience and the social science tells us about what happens, right? Um, everybody thinks that they are a scientist. They look at the evidence and then they come to a conclusion, okay? Um, now courts have to be disciplined to do that. Ordinary people don't. We're not scientists, we're all lawyers. We think what we think on the basis of our moral intuition and then we look for evidence to support that, right? That's the way ordinary people think without constant override, without discipline, without checks. And so again, I see no indication that the kinds of agencies that are operating in this very delicate arena where we ask so much of individuals to have that kind of objectivity are taking that particular um, responsibility seriously. Yes. Uh, <laughs> sure, go for it. Just very briefly, I think this is why we should also, though, never just entrust any part of our government with the immense amounts of powers that these agencies have, because you're gonna, it's, eventually there's gonna be, they're gonna be put to discriminatory means, I mean, and, uh, and in fact, those that are um, those elements in the society that are least able to, that are uh, most vulnerable to this type of of rhetoric, it, I, we, um, it, it's a, it's a it's a um, it's a yeah it's it's a it's a problem that um, C fifty nine kind of exacerbates, but definitely one that's been there for a long time. But uh, the, these the the in particular though the like the more active powers that these agencies are being entrusted with, where they can now go and, and basically um, act in this open-ended framework with very little limitations, really leaves uh, open um, a big door open to abuse to, to abuse this discriminatory sentiments. So I do think uh, so. I know I, I agree that the culture eats policy component of this, but like so with our, at least with the RCMP, there's limits to how much that could do a lot of damage, but how much that type of culture damage that type of culture can do. But with agencies like CSIS and CSE that operate in a very kind of open-ended manner with very few restrictions at all, um, the damage is just uh, multiplied exponentially. We'll go to the next questions, but I, do, I forgot to mention just so people can keep their questions uh, short, and especially we prefer questions and, and comments, um, just so we can get as many kind of questions in tonight. Hi, it's uh, Ken Rubin, and I don't think any of the panelists are out to lunch myself. Um, but uh, here's the question that I've, I've been trying to f think, think it through. Like, 
I deal with people who want to get their files, security and otherwise, and they have enough problems. But with the new Bill C-59 and so on, and Bill C-22, what recourse, what mechanisms do they really have or would you suggest if they want to complain as a group or individual to the new overview body or to the parliamentary committee like and Paul's mentioning that the due process and the Mickey Mouse nature of some of these things just go to the court but is, there's nothing that I could see in the laws that said you have certain rights to go and um, complain uh, or appeal to these bodies as an individual, um, even if you have your files and what have you. Information Commission is not going to be one of those people who can be able to review them. So what, what mechanisms do you have uh, or, or would you suggest? Yeah, th this is one point I didn't uh, get to uh, when I was speaking is that um, the, when, when you engage these complaint processes, the Security Intelligence Review Committee or this new body that they're creating, the National Security Intelligence Review Agency, you will very rarely learn much more than what you already know. They're not going to give you their investigation files. They're not going to tell you or confirm to you that yes, you're investigated here, here, here. In most circumstances, you might learn a tiny little bit. And my concern is that uh, there's no one challenging them. Well, why can't we at least tell that person, yes, they were a target for a period of time, and here's what we did. And for sure, I understand that you know national security, they'll say, and I, I will acknowledge this, some information they need to keep confidential. But they're so uh, hyper-secretive that it only creates more concerns in the individual. So what I would like to see would be um, like a, a special advocate type in the CERT process. Um, right now they say that the CERT Council does act like a special advocate, which is to say when you're not in the room, the CERT Council, they say, or some say, is supposed to be aggressively um, challenging two issues. One is challenging, do we really have to keep this secret? Can't we tell this individual? And let's, you know, I want to challenge a question, and is it really that essential, or is there really a danger if we tell this person this, this, and this. And the second thing they can do is they aggressively examine the, the CSIS witnesses. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Um, if we had a lawyer uh, 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 function that did that and it was set out in the statute, I'd feel more comfortable. Um, I'll acknowledge that I have encountered some CERT counsel that view that as their mandate and their role, but it's definitely not in the statute, the, the old one nor the new one. And I can tell you, more often than not, I encounter CERT counsel who definitely do not see that as their role. Um, they don't see it as their role to aggressively press CSIS to, you know, but well, let's try to, you know, give as much information as possible to that individual. Um, and hey, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Um, that's what we saw in the commissions of inquiry, uh, well, at least in the Arar one. I'm not sure if they were very good at all in the Yakubuch inquiry. Um, but in the Arar inquiry, we had Paul Cavaluzzo, who, who did an excellent job in challenging um, uh, CSIS and RCMP in those ex parte hearings. And if even if we had that, and on those two issues, like I'm saying, like, let's try to tell them more and let's find out what they're doing. If we at least had uh, a clear provision that gave like an independent counsel, someone who's even maybe independent from the agency uh, and CSIS who can go at them, uh, I think that would, uh, you know, uh, provide a significant uh, better system or safer. What, what about the parliamentary committee? You know, I mean, the, the parliamentary committee, I think it doesn't hurt. I mean, it doesn't hurt. We were the, one of the only countries, and here's, you know, the, we were one of the only countries uh, in, you know, in the Western world who did not have uh, legislative uh, bodies or committees that pro you know, provided some oversight. They treated MPs like any other person on the street and uh, didn't trust them and so forth and can't be told anything, which should give you some idea about their attitude toward their own ministers, right? <laughs> um, but but uh, I think if it, 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 it's at least just another window in, right? If, if more people know about what's going on, um, who, who have cause to question it, you know, who aren't in some way tied into those agencies or have a vested interest, um, I, I think that's all for the good. I mean, could that parliamentary uh, committee be better, could it be more robust? Sure, of course it could, but I for one was actually happy with that. At least if they, I mean, if, if, if committee members had known, if there was an inter, 
uh, a party or multi-party uh, committee around in like 02 and 03 and 04 and 05 when these most egregious abuses were taking place, I'd have to think one of them, one of them would have had the courage to stand up and say, whoa, 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 what's going on here? And you guys better do something about this and this is wrong and start challenging them. Because we really did not have that function before and I don't think we have that function right now anywhere else. So I'm a little bit hopeful about that process. Anyway. One other option, uh, particularly because a lot of the more egregious conduct is actually based on profiling information, uh, personal information collection, is uh, empowering the privacy commissioner to take a more active role, do more audits, and actually issue penalties when there's uh, against the agency. So it's still the government that's paying for it at the end of the day, but it makes them pay attention when their budget starts fluctuating. Um, but that, but there is an entity that uh, their role is to advocate on behalf of individuals, and they have uh, audit type powers. Problem is, they're, they're, the proxy act itself is kind of it's not very strong right now. It's being reexamined, but that could be another avenue to uh, allow some measure of oversight, particularly since a lot of these uh, uh, more egregious outcomes, like the, some of the more egregious fly listing, uh, Mahara was torture. All this is based on information how information is being collected, used, and uh, misclassified. Maybe, maybe I'll just have one thing, just on specifically on, on how people can bring complaints. Um, for the Committee of Parliamentarians, it's explicit that it, you, it's not a complaint-based body. Uh, you, you could write to an MP who sits on that body and tell them, you know, this happened to me, and if they decide to bring that up in the committee, uh, then they could examine it. But there's no formal process for filing a complaint. And with a new National Security Intelligence Review Agency, the complaint mechanism is, is limited to the three large national security agencies, so CSC, CSIS, and the RCMP. But for example, if it was foreign affairs or national defense or another body that you would have a complaint about their, uh, about their activities regarding national security, the body, you can maybe send a letter, and, uh, but you can file, file an official complaint in the same way. Um, the only powers that the review agency will have will be to mandate that department or ministry to conduct a study on that particular topic and report back to them on it. Um, and so it's so it's fairly limited. Um, the, is there a follow? Cause I, there's a couple other questions, but if it's directly, is it a comment on that directly? No, or no. I was wondering? just wondering if you were. Where does CBSC stand in there? Oh. Um, they're, they're covered by the National Security and Review you Intelligence. You could only lodge a complaint against RCMP. Yeah, you, can, uh, you can't lodge a complaint against CBS. Yeah, you, CBSA is not included in the complaints process, I don't think. So why don't you do that? Uh, sorry? Why don't you change it? That, that, that <laughs> it would be good to broaden it, but CBSA isn't. Or now I'm questioning whether or not they are. Yeah, so. Um, for the National Oversight Review Body, I believe that CBSA, in terms of its national security um, activities, could be covered. But an ordinary CBSA complaint, um, that's pushing for, if you will, ordinary police oversight powers, um, which we have some reason um, to be a, a little bit hopeful about, but they would be coming down the track. So we have to keep our eyes peeled for that. But yeah, CBSA peels off, if you will, into ordinary policing and national security concerns. So, so there's a, there will be a bifurcated coverage um, eventually, we hope. Because currently, as you may know, CBSA complaints might as well, you might as well whistle into the wind. Are you talking about the parliamentary agency? No, not, not parliamentary. Uh, I don't know. I disagree with that interpretation really? with all due respect. Uh, yeah. the, the respect to any other portion of the federal public administration, it was my understanding that that part of it is meant to be any other portion of the federal public service that may have uh, involved in national security issues. Yeah, that's so CBSA is covered, but right. but the, the, the ordinary complaints mechanism for CBSA in their ordinary policing function yeah. will have to be in right. another act. Yes, yeah, that's yes. All I'm only national security that's right. activities. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. that's Sorry it. about that. That's yes, right. yes. Yeah. So like detention of refugees and so forth, right. there's no body no. For, to review that. Yeah, that's absolutely true, which is outrageous. So that the next hand I had is over here, and then I'll start. Hi, um, my name is Joy Sen. I'm, I'm an outsider in the sense I come from India, so I don't know the context here. But I, I just want to preface what I, the question I'm going to ask with sort of a historical thing. I, I think what we're seeing, we're at, we've entered a new stage 
where, of history where uh, these issues are getting more and more complex with the development of the internet, with, with the cyberspace, with, and with secrecy, and the development of the deep state working in combine. Uh, and I think this is going to become only more so. So I was interested, uh, one, is what is the forward perspective that you're looking at? Because five years down the line, it's going to become only more complex, not less complex. So I think that, I, I, I feel that we need to be, I'm speaking from the Indian context, we definitely are, have entered a new phase of the secret, the secret, the secrecy that the government, the state can exercise over people's personal data and what they do with it. And there's a massive kind of process right now which you perhaps know about. Now, I, the question I had though was, you referred, for instance, to the creed the curve from the courts. What does it take? Like, what does it take? What is your answer to that? To getting your agencies here to become accountable and to prying them open. Yes, there's a definition of national security, which is, I didn't see discussed here, the validity of the concept of national, like of um, terra nullius. Nothing existed, so we can, we can do what we like. Or of eminent domain, so we can do what we like. Similarly, national security has achieved that kind of sacredness now that nobody can question it. Uh, how does one open this up again? Because without this, we are not going to be able to reclaim democracy. It's only, I, so I just wonder if you could look ahead as to how in the Canadian context, where I think you have a, a very vibrant process of question and answer and demand, uh, how can you do this? I'm so glad you have asked me that question, because of course I have the answer. <laughs> of course I do. Um, I, I don't have the answer. Um, I think that in a number of places, I, I, I agree with you so um, robustly. How do ordinary people stay on top of all of this? I know that some of the um, answers that are being proposed, and they are partial only, include things like, um, if we're going to be doing big data analytics, and gosh knows, we are, and have been for a decade and haven't known anything about them, how do we get the kind of um, expertise involved in those to ask those questions of proportionality and necessity that have so far um, been completely evaded? So what's happened here when CSIS, out of the CSIS Act, Section 13 of the CSIS Act required that CSIS not collect anything that wasn't strictly necessary to its mandate. Strict necessity is a high standard. They were ingesting entire databases, probably not meeting the standard. That's what CERC was signaling. Don't think you're meeting the standard here. Don't even think you're trying. C59 says, okay, go ahead and just. But, you know, like, be, be reasonable, whatever that means. What does that mean? What does it mean in the context of data analytics to look at an entire huge database of information? To do what? To do what? What we know in terms of, again, we know this fairly well, um, you cannot predict who is going to be a terrorist on the basis of no amount of information. Do those analytics actually wash? So you must be doing something. You're doing some kind of mapping. And we need to actually ask you, what is the efficacy of that exercise? And we need to have the kind of expertise that would be able to fairly adjudicate that. Um, and again, that takes us well outside of the normal course of your average lawyer, your average minister. Um, so developing that, that kind of in-house expertise in terms of these bodies will be critical. Um, but that's a very partial answer um, to the question. But it's just one that is so um, necessary and so top of mind for me in terms of um, the kind of the kind of analysis that's needed to check what has been an absolutely free ride uh, on in, in terms of this is for national security, ergo it is necessary, as opposed to is this necessary for national security. And if we don't have the kind of expertise available that would be able to make 
a substantive challenge to that. We can't even have the discussion. And so that seems to me um, an element of this that we simply, um, we must find. We must find. I mean, you'll hear, you'll hear language like, we need algorithmic transparency. Okay? I, have, I have no expertise in algorithmic transparency, but I can tell you it is more difficult to even think about than it is to say. Um, it is incredibly challenging. We know that, um, we know that you know, discrimination can be baked into an algorithm as well as can be baked into an ordinary human being. How do we go about remedying that? Certainly, again, ordinary citizens, ordinary lawyers, ordinary ministers do not have that expertise. So, um, so we, need to, um, we need a whole new sphere of um, experts to call upon in these fields in order to make meaningful any of the language that we might put into policy or statute, necessary, proportionate, reasonable, any of this will now be a, an increasingly mathematical assessment. And again, very, very difficult to challenge outside of a certain kind of expertise that most of us, and I certainly do not have. I, I think you asked like the most crucial question of the night. Right now, from my perspective, our democracy is inverted. As citizens, what the government does should be completely transparent. And what we do in our own personal lives should be private. We should be able to do what we want in our own personal lives, uh, share with family or friends or associates or civil society organizations to whom we wish or, or religious organizations. We should make those choices. And our personal lives should be private but the government should be transparent. Right now it's the opposite. More and more and more what the government is doing is secret. And what they know about our lives is known to them, right? They're surveilling us more and more and more. So it's turned right on its head. And um, so that's why I think what's happening now is so scary for me because that the kinds of exceptional things they did in the wake of 9-11 have now become normalized they become normalized features of our law. It's not like back in, you know, you look, like countries have had, uh, um, you know, threats and issues before, including Canada. We had, uh, you know, uh, violent uh, separatists in Quebec in the 60s and the 70s. There were regular bombings in, throughout the 60s in Quebec. But we did not have to use exceptional powers to combat that. In, in the Quebec uh, October crisis, they did, but that was the uh, War Measures Act, and it was invoked for a very limited time, and then it was over. Those kinds of powers in the, in the War Measures Act, they're now normalized. They're part of our regular features of law that can be used at any time. And our government is not justifying it. They're not getting it into a debate and a dialogue. The, the Bill C-51 processes were so facile, it was embarrassing. You know, those ministers got up and they said the most ridiculous platitudes to justify why some of these measures were necessary with absolutely no evidence or uh, even examples, at least with the green paper, as like some of them were kind of silly in my view, and I, I had real issues with the green paper. At least it made some attempt to start the dialogue and say, here's why these powers are necessary. When the conservative government introduced C-51, they didn't tell. It's like, I, I still, like the no-fly list, it's like the, the privacy commissioner in Canada said a few times, why do we need this? We don't even know how many people are on that list. In 2007, when it was first introduced, a Minister of Transport, Lawrence Cannon, said at the time, there was 2,000 people on the list. That's the last time it's been publicly disclosed how many are on that list. But 2,000 people, seriously? Like, let's imagine if it's, that's what the number is now, although I think it's much, much higher today, but we seriously have 2,000 people walking around our society who are imminently about to bomb a plane? That's absurd. It's absurd, right? And so these secret watch lists, I think, are, are terrible. They're infringing on our liberty. Uh, they're infringing on our privacy. Uh, our, our governments right now are completely backward. And your second question is, well, how are we going to hold them accountable? I, I, it's just, it's an ongoing process. It's a struggle. I mean, what happened with the RCMP in the 1970s, we got to a crisis point and then things changed with the McDonald Inquiry. Um, it came out in the McDonald Inquiry that there were secret files on 1.8 million Canadians. They were surveilling uh, uh, civil liberties organizations, trade unions, church groups, political parties, and they had files on all of them. Uh, I've been counseling them on the board for the BC Civil Liberties Association. Uh, I found files uh, uh, through um, uh, 
access to information request from the early 70s, where they had spies in board meetings of the BC Civil Liberties Association. And then they had comments about how they might be able to try to create schisms or splinters within the group. Like, oh, this person's saying this, and I think these guys don't like them, so we should start. Like, seriously, that's how they were operating back then. And when that came out of the McDonald Inquiry, Canadians went, wow, no way, this has gone way too far, and it stopped, and we changed legislation, and, uh, and the culture changed. But now, I mean, uh, after 9-11, we had, I think the Arar inquiry was a really massive wake-up call and a lot of things changed, but I think we've just slid right back. And, and moreover, we're going further. Like with the digital world, I think the, the capacity for the government to spy on us, to collect information on us, is, is, is uh, you know, far exceeds anything that they've had before. And I, I don't know, I think it's, it, it didn't hold anything in part because maybe the US has never really owned up to, to the mistakes they made, the serious human rights violations they made. Like, they've got torturers walking around, right? Acknowledged torturers, like multiple, like hundreds of torturers, and that's okay in their society. They, I don't know, if they don't ever have an owning up in their own culture, in their own society, they did in the 70s, right? Like we did, we had our McDonald's party, they had the church report, I don't know if people remember that, they had the church report on the FBI and, and all the excesses of uh, J. Edgar Hoover and so forth. They never had, they didn't have that moment. They've never had an Arar Commission moment in the wake of 9-11. And I think that's why it's been so difficult for our changes to say. But all I can say is I think we need another crisis and we need to keep, keep acting on um, Yeah, a little bit of, uh, I mean, I feel like in part, part of the problem is because it's getting so technical and so sophisticated and the capabilities are developing now at the rate of technological innovation as opposed to the rate of, uh, security innovation, which is what was happening historically. Um, many of us probably feel this, but I certainly do. We are really fighting a holding pattern, so we're trying to hit like the worst things that are coming. Has it been, it's not really even getting to the point where we have time to try to roll back uh, um, uh, some of the things that are already uh, taking place. But, so, but, but again, um, we, there are some of, the, some of the things are really important because you can tell that they're gonna have uh, down the road impacts, so for example, the Security Information Sharing Act that Michael was talking about in the beginning. Uh, take the Indian example, uh, at Adhar, right? We have a, a, an immense digital um, DNA database now uh, that the country's gathering. A bill like that would let them use that now for any security purpose that they wanted, which is a really, like, it's a, sh it's a, it's a purpose shift that's really, really uh, problematic. Um, so getting, getting some protections around those types of um, mechanisms as they come out and trying to at least not let them set in more, knowing that eventually we're going to have even more sensitive data feeding into this apparatus. Um, it do does help. Uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, you know, in the 70s when they introduced not, not just the separation of like where, where the hive offs took away uh, our, the RCMP's right to go and act in security, you know, very broadly defined security interests, but also introduced uh, things like the wire, like wiretapping was made a criminal offense, and it was uh, even, even, um, even if the RCMP did it, even if the police did it, if they conducted a wiretap without a judicial authorization, it was criminal, it was a very strict regime. Our numbers of wiretapping um, in Canada uh, before this, this wiretapping regulation came in um, were per capita, I think like, it was like, I think they were four times higher than U.S. wiretaps federally, not without correcting for per capita. And when you consider that their population is ten times higher than ours, that's a that's a very big, uh, very robust shift. So some some legal rules can have some impact, but the problem is um, uh, you can only really hit because the government is the one that's kind of driving the conversation and driving where the the. Where these where the where these activities are going, you can actually hit the most egregious ones some of the times, um, and it takes a big crisis to really have a, a, fun, a fundamental reshifting things. I'm hoping that we're getting there soon uh, in the U.S. Uh, a lot of people are getting more upset at how um, the government there is uh, using their powers um, now in, in, cre in, in increasingly more discriminatory ways that are impacting on more people. And uh, what the U.S. does does affect other countries because our agencies take their lead from the U.S. agencies on a lot of things and uh, our policing agencies do as well. So uh, hopefully that's coming um, and uh, maybe there'll be some hope there. Thank you. Um, so maybe just uh, for time-wise, because we only have time for a few more questions, Maybe we'll take the two questions here, and then we'll have some responses, and I'll take two more questions. I know there was one over there. Is there somebody else? Yeah. And then we'll kind of, so we'll kind of bunch the questions. How about we'll, we'll paper, scissors, rock, and we'll only have one answer to each question. That's good. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Um, I don't think the wire's going to stretch all the way to where you're sitting. So you could even just, if you're loud enough, to set Yeah, I think I could probably, probably manage to be loud enough. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm an anarchist. Uh, a lot of people I know are communists and socialists, and a lot of people on the radical left. But you, you touched on uh, the subject. My cell phone is in the same room with your cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> um, you touched on the subject that the RCMP spied really heavily. I mean, it's well known, it's spied really heavily on communists. Uh, and I'd say it, it hasn't really changed all that much. Uh, things changed, but the spying hasn't really changed. And the, certainly people I know, like the, the whole creating schisms in groups, I'm sure that's going on now. Um, one of my friends who's a, a, a Canadian Union you know, of Postal Workers activist uh, says that he basically assumes that everything he does is known. Um, and a, a lot of people I know make that same assumption. And it's, it's not a very pleasant, a pleasant thing to assume about what's going on in your life. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, uh, wh what do you think, act what can activists do to protect themselves from our, the RCMP, CSIS, and CSC? It's a quick question. It's, um, I'm just wondering if there's a model out there, if there's some country that any of you think, a country or countries that have a, you know, doing a better job of protecting similarity and having stronger oversight. First question. Was there, oh, was it? I was going to do those two and then okay. do the, uh, the next two after that. Okay. Because we got the last one because to, to both of those really just unfortunately the capabilities have gone the the technical capabilities have gone to the point where there is not a lot you could do we do really need fundamental policy changes um, we did uh, we actually uh, as part of an international coalition we tried to find the best practices uh, country but um, couldn't so we came up with our own <laughs> nobody's yet made it into law but we're working on it um, not very hopeful but. Um, it, I think there needs to be a combination of policy, cultural change. Uh, there's definitely some things you can do yourself uh, using you know, more, encrypted, more encryption and security tools, but the capabilities of the agencies these days are far outstripping anything that individuals can, um, can uh, address on their own. And just one last thing on uh, a transparency would actually help here, because like, um, there's maybe X percent chance that your colleague is actually actually being profiled to that degree, but they might be. So if there's a lot more clarity around who's actually being the target, like uh, if there were more mechanisms to to get clarity on who is being the target of these mechanisms, at least maybe um, not while they're an, uh, an active potential threat, but after a certain period of time, like maybe people would um, like part part of the problem is that you can't know, so you have to assume that that they are able to get everything. Um, so if there was more transparency around some of those mechanisms and more ways of finding out who has, who is actually being profiled and to what degree, um, I, I think that would actually make things better. Here's some super practical advice, and, and this, I have some clients where I'm always, like I, I, I think I'm, I'm sure that they're listening or following and whatnot me all the time. Uh, if, if, so I just assume when I'm talking to my clients most of the time they know. Uh, but if it's something that I am really worried about that I really don't want them to know, which is to say I think that it may uh, put my client at risk or something like that, uh, I've adopted this uh, new technology um, and it's uh, uh, thin um, white stuff and you get a pen and you write on it <laughs> and you send letters because they've given up on what checking they the CCTV here? They, they, they check and, and you don't, well, and, but I'm not joking actually, literally. Uh, I set up meetings in person and I'll meet in parks and I don't bring cell phones. It's that simple. It's like old school, like you watch the, the you know, like the spies in the 50s and they do paper drops and stuff like that. I think we have to get to that world now when we want to talk about stuff like, are you going to organize an environmental protest? Are you going to organize a, a protest against a pipeline? Uh, don't bring your phones. Don't put it on Facebook. Uh, do it by word of mouth. Maybe, maybe uh, some like paper posters in a certain specific place, like only in your church, not outside your church, saying it's going to be in the church because that then might lead them to come there. And I think it's just like old school technology like that. Uh, when you when you are working with others on issues that the government views as contrary to their policies. Yeah. And can I just say, um, everybody needs to be a privacy advocate, and there's a reason for that. One hundred percent. Right now, it drives me crazy when people say, what can I do to avoid having my device searched at the border? And I said, don't take don't your device, yeah. right? And they say, won't that look suspicious, yeah. right? 
And essentially, we have to act collectively as the normal thing to do is to care about your privacy so that we don't essentially create a targeting of people who do care about their privacy and do things like Michael Vaughn and pay for stuff in cash, right? Yeah. That shouldn't mark you out as a dangerous radical and security <laughs> concern, right? So, I mean, make, kick up some fuss about the ability to do these things because if we lose those abilities, and I'm talking about things like paying for stuff in cash, um, then anybody who fights for it, again, becomes suspect. And so we, we need to work more collectively to make something, caring about privacy is a normal human trait, not a dangerous characteristic. Um, so we have two questions over here, here, and in the back. Do you want water? Is why is that really a question? Why, okay, I'll put it as a question, though. What's stopping us as citizens from holding these agencies, okay, by not paying our taxes until they stop dropping the walls of secrecy and being able to be uh, beholden to us? As the lawyer, I can tell you, there are a number of cases like that. They're called free men on the land, and they've tried that. It hasn't really worked out well for them. Uh, many of them have ended up in jail. Yeah, they, they, many of them have ended up in jail despite very ingenious uh, legal arguments. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Dwayne Winsack. Last year I was in the UK and I was at a conference and they had uh, a nice enough bloke from the Home Office, I think it was, come by and speak with uh, uh, UK-based civil uh, Liberties Group about the uh, renewal of the um, uh, Regulation and Investigative Powers Act. Yes, Rip yeah, up. yeah, Rip up. And so I always have to ask questions. And so I asked uh, the nice uh, gentleman from the Home Office, um, I said, you know, what you just described to me, I hadn't heard it ever put so you know, kind of blatantly or kind of literally, sounded like the haystack model. You want to collect it all to find the needle. And he said, yes, sir, you're right. And I said, mm, that's just okay. And he said, yes, but there are some time constraints and there are some oversights. Now, Tamir, you are saying that it sounds like you kept referring, you repeated it several times, the mass surveillance model, which is you know synonymous with the haystack model. Is there a difference between what the UK is doing, their haystack model versus our haystack <laughs> model? Is our is is the Bill C fifty nine? in the round better or worse than uh, RIPA, which looks terrible, but I'm not up to speed on this stuff, mm -hmm. because as you say, this stuff, unless you're keeping your finger on the pulse, you can't keep up. Um, so we get to use their, hate, their haystack, so that's one of the things that, sorry. We get to actually use the UK's haystack, so that's part of it. Um, our CSC's network is uh, like plugged into the UK, to the GCHQ, which is their, their yeah. CSC's uh, network, and they're integrated on the back end, so they can they can search our data, we can search their data. We use their data in our, in our, in our activities, so we get to actually, so it is, to a certain degree, part of the same haystack. Um, many of the reforms in C59 were actually overtly modeled on the ones in the IPA, the reform of the, the it wasn't actually, it didn't end up being the reform of part of Ripple, let's say, uh, which expanded it a bit, so there are a lot of similarities. Um, much like in uh, the IPA, the new RIPA, um, CSC Act specifically says like, you can do untargeted collection, which just basically means like collect everything without trying to really like spend too much time thinking whether you need it or not, which is the core of that element of RIPA, now, of, of uh, the new IPA. Now there's some parts of the new IPA that we haven't taken on yet, which are good, but are part of the consult ongoing national security consultation that the government initiated, so they still might come down later. Things like uh, mandating people to provide passport passwords at the airport or, or face jail sentences. Um, things like uh, what are called, um, um, uh, uh, um, they have uh, new equipment, uh, new obligations that they put on equipment manufacturers where they need to actually like change how their equipment works to allow for mass surveillance in ways that we, we haven't taken on yet. So there's, there's other things in, in the IPA that are bad that we haven't taken on yet, but that bulk model is definitely kind of at the core of, of what uh, C-59 encodes. Um, are there any other questions that people might have? Sure. 
Yeah, we'll take this as the, as the last question, and then also we'll have to give everyone a chance to maybe remark too. Hi, I'm just curious about whether the um, whistleblower protections, if there are any in Canada, are, um, how do they fit into the legal framework of these new bills? Yeah, I forgot. I, I apologize because I alluded to it, but then I didn't close the loop on that. So bad, uh, bad point of public speaking. Um, the Public Servants Disclosure Protection Act is our is our whistleblowing legislation, which is. Uh, it creates a body called the Public Sector Integrity Commissioner where any federal government employee can bring uh, a concern or a complaint of wrongdoing. Uh, the Act defines it. So whenever you think someone's doing something wrong in your department, you can bring a complaint of wrongdoing and this independent body will investigate it confidential to see if there is indeed uh, wrongdoing. So let's say, uh, hypothetically, um, back in uh, early 2002, when um, some RCMP and uh, CSIS people uh, wanted to use um, information that came from a confession, quote-unquote confession by Ahmed al-Mahdi under torture in Syria, where they suspected that he likely had been tortured uh, in providing that information. Someone could have gone to this Public Sector Integrity Commissioner theoretically and said, whoa, 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 we are about to act on information that we suspect was from torture, we're about to get warrants, we're about to share information with other countries as though this was true, uh, and naming other Canadian citizens as terrorist suspects. This is wrong, someone might get hurt, people might get hurt, we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, that would be great. The only problem is that the Public Sector Integrity Commissioner in that act uh, does not allow complaints from CSIS. So um, a CSIS employee is aware that they're acting on information from torture or about to share information where someone's uh, uh, life or security of the person might be at risk. They can't do anything except complain internally and uh, that does not end well for them. So that's part, oh, and they can't make complaints to CERC. There's a specific provision that does not allow them to make complaints to the Security Intelligence Review Committee about their own uh, body's activities. And that provision is carried into this new National Security Intelligence Review Agency. So essentially that other safety valve that we have with whistleblowers, um, we really don't have a mechanism uh, for whistleblowers in the national security realm. And that's, that's another big, big, Huge problem, I would say. Thanks. Um, I think we'll give each of you a chance to say, you know, a quick concluding remark, and then I have a couple of announcements and things I'd like to say. But, um, but yeah, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap things up for tonight. I, I think I've said my remark. Um, I dropped the mic on the last thing that I said, so I'm going to let that, that go. Was a lot of See, so <laughs> I'm, I'm going to leave that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't really have anything to add. Um, except for, I, I think we're going to start seeing another, when we get more change, it's because we're going to have another crisis situation. Uh, and it won't be of one small um, racialized minority where it makes it easier for the majority of the population to look the other way. Uh, it's going to be like, I think, environmentalists or where it's going to happen next. When our environment and our climate starts changing, to such a dramatic effect that people, uh, bigger numbers of people start getting involved in more direct actions. The kind of surveillance and monitoring that we see of environmentalists right now is going to become more serious and more invasive and we'll start seeing things happen to environmentalists like we saw happen to, you know, completely innocent uh, Arab Canadians. I think once that starts happening and it start affecting a broader range of Canadians, that's when we might actually see change again because I think that's where it's going to happen. Sorry to be dark. <laughs> I'm hoping that we don't have to wait uh, for the global climate apocalypse <laughs> before we use a positive change. Uh, you made it right, though. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think it's great. I think I'm, I'm uh, encouraged. I'll just say that some people are coming out and engaging on these issues. We see it more and more as uh, people hear more about. Um, uh, what like where things have, are going um, with uh, with the um, and, and how these power these these agencies are growing are increasingly lowering and using their powers in ways that are abusive uh, of, of minorities but also impacting on the privacy of individuals more broadly people are starting to get more concerned about that I'm as more people hear about it and uh, get educated about it I think we're going to hear more resistance uh, people in Canada at least I, I think we've seen some backlash when uh, when there's been impacts even on visible minorities in ways that seem in 
um, that not in touch with our, our, our view of Canada as a, as a kind of a multicultural place, particularly when we see it in the US, but then when we see our own agencies doing the same thing, there's a bit of a, sometimes a point for reflection there that I hope will kick in soon. Um, maybe I'm a little bit too optimistic. I've been, definitely been told that before and <laughs> by people on this panel, so. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but that's my, uh, I guess I'll end on that semi-optimistic note. Thank you so much to all three of you for participating. Definitely, uh, we work on these things every day, but every time I have a chance to hear the three of you speak or, or speak to each of you, I, I learned something new and I learned a lot tonight, and I'm, I'm hoping everyone here learned, learned a lot tonight and we'll be able to kind of bring some of that stuff forward with them. Um, it's a lot of information. Uh, it's hard to know what to do with it sometimes. Um, we as a coalition, and I know other organizations, are working on public actions around Bill C-59 to try to react and put pressure to uh, make sure that these arguments are heard more publicly and, and exert pressure and maybe see some amendments and see some, some positive actions uh, you know, in, in the future. So I really encourage everyone to keep an eye out for that. Um, there's also people who are working on very specific campaigns. I know there's people here tonight who are working on the Hassan Diab Support Committee, who's a, a, a Canadian professor who is in prison in France right now without trial, mm -hmm. has been in prison for three years. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, I won't go into all the details, but it's a terrible case, and so there's, there's flyers I can see right here that, uh, that Rhea has, and so if people are interested in finding out and getting involved with that, I'd really encourage it. And uh, we share information about things like that on our News Digest every week, so if you signed up to that email list, you'll start receiving our News Digest. But share it around, ask people to sign up, and really the more we can share this information around, hopefully the more we'll get to that critical mass of making both privacy, you know, activism and, and actions kind of the, the norm, so that people taking actions aren't the exception, and aren't targeted, and also that we reach that critical mass that we can really start to, uh, to change things. So that, thank you so much for coming out tonight. And again, I, I have to plug it again, uh, we're fundraising at the ICLMG right now, so if you can, uh, it's iclmg.ca slash donate if you're able to support us. And uh, this is the start of a new monthly speaker series. Um, so in October, on October 24th, uh, we'll be having our next one. We're going to be looking at uh, the impact of national security on Islamophobia and racism in Canada. And so we really hope we'll get more information out about that soon. But we hope that you'll be able to come out for that as well and, uh, and share it with your, your friends and in your networks. So is, is there anything else I have? The donation box? Yeah. Yeah, we also just have a donation box at the front, so if you do want to give right now, uh, feel, feel free. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Low, low tech privacy. Yeah, low tech privacy. <laughs> just cash. No one can track it. No one knows it's you. So. <laughs> thanks again, everybody, and thanks for everyone who tuned in online as well.